university is a system and like any system it has its rules it has um, ways in which you can really use the system to work smart and not hard and so one of the things that university students especially entering university are really nervous about is the set of expectations and your high school teachers and your SEJEP professors have been basically instilling fear in you since grade nine uh, and they're not always the best people to equip you with university because they're scaring you to death and what you really need to do is get excited uh, and get excited about entering into this new world and being able to fashion yourself in a new way or develop yourself even more and so one of the things that I always suggest is working smart not hard and so what does that mean working smart but not hard and one of the things that really helps is that you choose something that you love and you choose courses that you love and you get really excited about. And so one of the first things I tell my students coming into their first year is go and sit in a number of different courses and take a syllabus, read the course outline, get a feel for the professor, get a feel for the dynamic of the course. And if it's something you know you really won't enjoy from the beginning, get out. Sign up for another course. There's an ad drop period that is two weeks long and you can go and shop for courses and you can shop for professors and you can shop for programs and you're never tied to any one thing. So when you sign up in the summertime, I'm going to major in English or in drama or in biochemistry. You're never tied to that when you arrive at the university and in fact one of the great strengths, one of the working smart not hards is to understand that you can change your mind and you can go in a different path and you have the flexibility and the freedom and even the support at Bishops to be able to do that. So that you're here not to prep for exams and to get marks, you're really here to get an education. So I think that students should really concentrate on learning the material and taking advantage of the opportunities that are given to them instead of really just worrying, okay, what do I need to do to get an 85? And I do direct this particularly towards science students who are often extremely marks oriented. And you know, anyone, a med school interview, um, a graduate school interview, basically what they're going to want to see is, you know, do you enjoy learning? Are you in this for the learning or are you in it just as a means to an end? And perhaps to start, the most important thing is to do the exact opposite of what most people typically do, which is to come here thinking that you're preparing yourself for a career. That is almost always a mistake because in so doing you lose the opportunity to really devote yourself to this place for the three or four years you're here as an end in itself, as a, as a rich, powerful experience of learning, learning that could really transform your life, that could be full of epiphanies for you in which you leave as a fundamentally different person than you came here. And so if you come here expecting to be transformed, expecting to be a different person than you started, then the kinds of aspirations that you had for yourself when you were 18 or 19, when you got here, and that led you to be thinking about the kind of career paths that you were uh, ruminating about at that time, well, those things will all have been transformed. Right? And so the, the very things that you take yourself to be aspiring towards when you're 18, if you treat this place as an end in itself, will be different. Uh, and so it's far better to come here thinking, I am going to make this the richest, most transformative experience I've had in my entire life up to that point, and then see where it takes you. The other thing I would say is that I'm, I've always been suspicious of anybody at 18 who had a life plan. It seems to me that university is a place where you could take the opportunity to explore all kinds of different things and, and find the thing that really brings passion into your life. I know in my own case I didn't, I didn't discover philosophy, which turned out to be my uh, life's love, until university. And, and at that point I discovered it by accident. I think people that are undeclared should explore things they think might be interesting for them. Um, but I, uh, like, I really think that um, what you want is a sustained, passionate relationship to something. Because uh, if you don't have that, it's going to very soon be like a job that you 
are indifferent to. You know, the, uh, people have these sorts of experiences in their lives where they're they're doing something for money or they're doing something to pass the time. Uh, people need to aim higher than that. We like, we need something that we can be extraordinarily passionate about, and that doesn't manifest itself. Uh, sometimes for people until they're 30 or 40 years old, let alone 18 or 20 years old. So yeah, people should explore, they should travel, um, they should um, uh, take part in, in plays, they should sing in choirs, they should uh, play sports, they should do all sorts of things um, to test the limits that they have in all of these uh, sorts of areas. Yeah, like one, one thing about bishops that is fantastic and about liberal arts is that you can take classes in, you know, things that just interest you and that's, you know, that's the pure reason for it. Um, so if you're from another faculty, you're from music, drama, whatever, you can do, you know, a psychology course and you can find out whatever, you know, something specific about if you want to know about personality, if you want to know about psychology of music, you want to know about sexuality, whatever you are, you know, interested in maybe because of your own experiences you can do it here um, and you know part of our role is is supporting you to teach you these different skills. I really encourage my students to take courses outside their comfort zone. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same with other disciplines but biology students come in and they're like how many biology courses can I take and I'm like well you have to do an elective and they're like well I want to do another biology course and I say no take something outside of your comfort zone because you never know what you're going to learn. Um, students sometimes will take a music course and they'll discover a passion that they never knew they had. And not only that, but employers now are looking for people who can look at a problem from different perspectives. And if you come just from a scientific, a biology perspective, well you are at a disadvantage to someone who's really taken full advantage of the liberal arts experience, maybe taking some classics, some Japanese, some calligraphy. They are going to maybe come up with a creative response to that problem. So I really recommend that all students take courses in as many different fields as they can. When we, when we come to study at any university, you should have a really good work-life balance. So basically your studies and your fun time. And both should be balanced. And a lot of students that come to bishops uh, do well at finding that balance. Some go too hard in the work and get burnt out and some go too much in the fun and don't do anything good. So basically my suggestion is finding that balance, but not only finding that balance at a given point in time, but having it throughout the whole semester. So instead of having fun throughout most of the semester and cramming for the exams, and then you're cramming too much in a too short period of time, basically try, my biggest advice is try to keep up with everything throughout the whole semester. So you have some time to play, have some time to have fun, but you're getting through and you'll never have that huge stressful point at the end of the semester. You need to work every day. You need to work on things every day. That's one thing I would say. Um, people tend to save things until the end. That's never a good idea. It's awfully hard to learn that when you're 20 years old, but nevertheless. It's very important to work steadily. If you have questions about something, you didn't understand something, you should look into it as soon as you can. Go see your teachers, take, take advantage of the uh, resources available. And um, that way you can find out early enough, you know, when you, what areas you might be having difficulty with, so that by the end of the semester, you've done everything possible to do a good job. I think for any student, it's just important to keep up. I think the worst mistake that students make is they just study for exams. And I always tell my students that every week, once a week, for every single course, you should spend an hour going through your notes and make yourself some cheat sheets. So when it comes to the exam, well, you're way ahead. At the end of every class, and I know the last five minutes of class, all you're thinking about is getting out of class. Um, but I think it's really important to just sit for a minute and think, even if you just jot down two sentences, what were the big things I learned from that? Um, any kind of strategies you have for knowing how you're doing and um, where to get help too I think is really important so don't be afraid to talk to your profs we want to help you <laughs> um, and uh, you know if there's a particular professor who you just really you know feel is a great mentor for you or um, then talk to that person and use them as a resource because we all we all like to it's part of our job and we do enjoy doing that
essays. Yeah, and everybody across the board pretty much has to write an essay, right? And a lot of times students roll their eyes and go, oh my god, essays, I'm not learning anything, I have to do this. And what they don't realize is that an essay is a transferable skill. And you transfer that and you use that after you graduate whether you go into graduate school or you go into the job market because you, all people have to be able to craft an argument and they have to then deliver that argument clearly and effectively, right? This sort of written communication. But you also have to come up with a persuasive argument, right? So you have to persuade somebody of your point of view with evidence and analysis. And so it's not just something that we as sadistic professors force you into doing just because you have to, but in fact, it's a skill that is so transferable. And a lot of students, it, it's a development, right? You're developing your, what I like to call your critical voice. You're not going to be good at it automatically, right? It's not some intuitive skill that you picked up and you've internalized and you can just go and write anything from a first year intro to lit paper to a upper year biochemistry thesis. It's something that you're constantly having to work on and you're constantly uh, revising and tweaking the ways in which you make arguments. As you find when you argue with your friends over a beer about whether or not Chaucer was a feminist, right? You're constantly working on how to build that kind of argument. And so my best advice for writing an essay and writing a really good essay First and foremost is go and see your professor and bounce those ideas and get that kind of exchange and dialogue and work out your ideas uh, with somebody else, with a sounding board and ask them to copy down your ideas as they flow and what you'll find is you actually know more even as you start writing your essay than you think you do. Just proofread because something that's happened to me in the past is, you know, like a student has typos in their essay or something that they haven't looked over, they've maybe been you know hurriedly handing it in at the last minute, and the worst thing that can happen is that your typo is funny, like you maybe accidentally write a rude word, or you know the spell checker has changed it to something completely different, um, and I've actually like burst out laughing at some mistakes that students have had in their essays in the past, and you don't you don't really want your prof to be like you know in in the fit of the giggles about your very serious essay, it's not the best thing. So it's that five minutes, you know, that you might be like, I, I don't have this time, but do make it because it could make all the difference between, you know, the way that it comes across. Science students have to learn how to write. And um, I don't think high schools teach writing like they used to because we see a lot of our students, even in third and fourth year, and they have real problems putting together a coherent lab report or a coherent essay. And we expect extremely high writing skills in our students. So if you're a first year, if you're a second year a science student, branch out, take a course with a large writing component. And because writing is an art and you have to practice it over and over and you have to do a lot of writing to get good at it. And then in fourth year, you hit science courses that ask for you to write an essay. And so we have these students who never, who avoided everything that, have, that involved writing. Then I asked them to write them a 10 page scientific essay and they're, they're lost. So start writing early and use the writing center. At Bishops we have this wonderful resource. We have, I don't know, five to eight, I think they're all women. And basically their job is to help students with their essays. So a student will take an essay to the writing center and they will actually go through it with the student line by line, fixing the grammar, helping them with references. And I would say in my essays, students who go to the writing center probably increase their mark by 10 to 15 percent. So it can be a huge advantage. I teach a lot of labs. So you'll probably, if you're a science student, you'll probably take one of my labs when you're here. Um, advice that I can give in general that I've seen over the last few years that I've been working here is a lack of preparation for students coming into the lab. So what you should be doing, or what you can do, and this won't take you more than half an hour before lab or the night before, just take your lab book, go and read up on the compounds that you're using, on the safety, um, safety precautions to take while you're in the lab, read the procedure and even take notes on the procedure so that when you walk into lab you're not completely blind and again that saves time. So you'll save time, you'll come out of lab faster, your afternoons won't seem that long and you'll have more fun in the lab. You'll show you'll be much more organized, you'll actually be able to do your work, maybe even help out a friend while you're in here. So 
and profs will enjoy that. They notice that. So if someone comes in prepared, lab book open, they know what they're doing, and it helps your grade for sure. Uh, there's a good chance that you're going to have to work in teams within a university setting and also within a business setting. So if we go back to what I said previously about primacy and recency effect, I want you to really take this into consideration. Typically as a professor, what you tend to see is teams of three or five or even higher. The higher they go, they're more prone, there are certain people that won't actually go and do their work. In terms of doing their work, it could be the fact that they're maybe not meeting at the set times, they're not actually submitting their work on a timely manner, various aspects. Uh, the key thing that I'd advise you is if you're in first or second year, observe, look around you, pick your teams very strategically. You don't always have to pick your friends to actually work in teams with. Sometimes those can actually be the worst people to work with because you're too comfortable with them. Uh, the key thing I'd advise you is, it's a small campus. Hey, if it's first year, guess what? You're going to have the same people in the same classes for the next two to three years. Uh, if you do, which is actually the clinical term for this, is actually called social loafing, where you actually don't do your work, the sad news is, is eventually by the time you hit fourth year, guess what? No one's actually going to want to work with you because word has gotten actually gotten around about you. So the key thing I'd advise you is pick your groups very carefully. When you're in groups, Come prepared to your meeting, the first meeting, and actually set specific objectives and specific timelines. Don't move your timelines. Stick to them. Before you actually submit your project as a group, so for example, let's say your project was due today at 4 p.m., you shouldn't be meeting today at 3 o'clock, an hour before your project, and putting parts together. If each one of you has actually written sections, you have your own writing style. And if you haven't properly communicated, to one another, you might actually have overlapping sections. So the key thing I'd advise you is whenever your group papers do or your group project, your deadline should actually be two days before the official deadline. Meet in a group and read your paper together. Make sure that it actually flows, that it's consistent, that there's not redundancies in it, that you're not actually saying things that are kind of contradicting one another in the same paper. Uh, the only way you can do this is if you're actually properly communicating and you're setting enough time buffer to actually fix these things when they actually happen. And you'll find like, you know what, this will get easier as time progresses, but what will really, really make it easier is picking the right people on your team. So make sure you actually get to know people, observe, look at how they actually work, do they take academics seriously? If they do, these are probably people that you actually want to have on your team, right? You're in a world of adults. Yeah. Uh, it's a world of adult learning, it's a world where everybody is serious about what they're doing. Um, and they're not of a mind to chase you around and make sure that you do your stuff. They presume that you will, uh, and if they don't uh, see your work in the end, um, they'll take the measures that go along with that. Um, so it's not that it's without penalty, um, but you need to take responsibility for your own work. And there's a great joy that comes from taking responsibility for your own work, and in fact, when you take responsibility for your own work, you realize maybe for the first time in your life that that it's my work, you know, it's, it's, it's my thing that I've created, not some sort of exercise I'm doing for somebody else. So that's exciting, but it's also um, a little bit daunting, I think, for, for some people when they first get here. Another strategy that um, is really useful um, for you as a student is to, um, to make sure that you break your studying and your work on papers or on presentations up into chunks. So you want to set yourself uh, manageable goals and, and realistic goals. And it's even better if you can actually make those goals public. So even if you just say to your roommate, I'm working on this paper for an hour, um, come check on me and see how I did. And that might sound a bit hokey, but having a steady partner or somebody to just check, you know, did you do that, is going to be helpful. Um, so break it down into manageable parts and then it's okay to reward yourself too for successfully completing a part. Um, so you might say, I'm going to work for two hours on my essay and then I am going to go out to the gate or I am going to go and get a coffee with my friend and that's absolutely fine. You should reward yourself. Um, so breaking, breaking things down into manageable parts and the same goes for your studying and your, your review of your class notes too. So um, it's a good idea to regularly review your notes and not leave it all to the end. Um, another strategy you might use would be to um, kind of at different points in the course take stock of, okay, these are the PowerPoint slides, these are, these are the notes that I took, oh, I still have questions about this, um, I'm going to do a little summary of this topic and see if I can, if I can make that into manageable parts as well. Um, so I think that that's important. 
and of course managing your time is important and that it relates back to what I was just saying but um, you want to make sure that you're realistic about how much time you can spend studying in a row for example so if you know that you're a person who needs breaks then build breaks into your schedule um, and that doesn't mean that you can't go to the gym or that you can't uh, participate in an extracurricular activity I think actually that that will make your time more efficient when you do sit down to study and to write because you've given yourself time to do something else you've exercised your brain in different ways and um, so I think that that's a really important strategy as well. Well, I think back to this idea of mastering a system and developing a system for yourself so that you're really working smart and not hard. And I, in my undergraduate, uh, finally figured out the system. Once I started thinking of university as a place that I could really um, understand and understand the, the rules and the expectations, you can work within those rules and expectations. And so what I did when I was preparing for exams is I would play the, what would Dr. Riddell ask me? What kinds of things has she been talking about throughout the semester? What does she keep underlining? Uh, and I would anticipate all of the questions and I would set up these mock exams and then I would write them. I would literally give myself three hours. I'd time myself, I wouldn't take breaks. I'd set it up just as it was an exam scenario and I would write it and at the end of the three hours I would mark myself and I'd go, oh, I only got a 76. What in the world? I'm gonna do another one. And I would do them over and over and over again. And so by the time I got into the exam, I was just showing off. I was just showing off all of the knowledge that I had synthesized, analyzed, and digested in that process. So there are a number of different tricks, and every student has its own, their own system, right? So what works for me doesn't work for somebody else and works for another person. Uh, and that's just getting to know yourself, and you're going to discover yourself. You're going to discover your academic persona. You're going to discover your social persona. You're going to be exposed to things that you didn't realize we're even there. And so it's really working out a system based on also working out who you are uh, as you develop in university. Is that exam writing is a skill. And the more you practice, the better you will get at it. In exams, you will often be asked to explain concepts. And that is also something you can practice on explaining concepts. And for me, a good explanation consists of three elements. One, definition. 2. Theoretical context, 3. Empirical context. To define a concept means that you uh, supply an accurate description of it. To provide a theoretical context means that you relate it to other relevant theoretical concepts. Empirical context means that you are placing your concept in time and space. I think when it comes to exams, it's important to plan your answer. Sometimes I think you have all the elements in a paper, but since you did not organize your thoughts before you started writing, the presentation and the answer is just not that good, although you have all the elements. So, so I, I think it's very wise to plan your answer, plan it before you start writing. I think you can get many extra points by having a well-organized answer this time and time again and a lot of it I teach intro courses and then compulsory theory courses so I get students coming just from high school uh, or sage up even here and then students taking a very tough theory course which is one of the hardest ones they take and I stress the same thing in each course is that if you just try to memorize everything you're dead <laughs> um, essentially there's too much in a university level course to just sit back and try to memorize and so what my tip is always to do um, is to work not on memorizing but trying to actually understand the material. And that takes everything to a different level. Um, and one of the ways, what I, I guess the way that I could set it up for understanding is, um, look, I don't speak Greek at all. But if you gave me a list of 10 or 15 Greek words, I could memorize them, but I won't understand anything about them. And I can spit them out, but in probably a couple of weeks it's all gone and I didn't learn anything in the process. Don't treat your courses like a list of words from a language you don't speak. Right? Yeah, you can memorize them, you can probably come into the exam and maybe pass, um, but it accomplishes nothing. 
So understanding takes you to that next level where instead of just sitting back and memorizing things, you can actually pull pieces together. Right? So then you can ask yourself questions like, well, okay, why did we start here and end up here? Or how did we do that? What does the stuff we did in week three tell us about the things we learned in week, week one? Sorry. Right? And it's through this process of working the material and bringing it together yourself um, that you take that step and not only will you do much better in your courses, but uh, you actually learn something <laughs> throughout your degree, which is kind of the point of being here. Mm -hmm. The idea that you can um, just memorize material, I, I really am not a big fan of memorizing. You really have to understand the material well, and so when you are solving a problem, you, you're going from A to B and maybe changing a tax rate or some policy and find out exactly how that it'll influence the economy. Um, you can't memorize that. The economy is constantly changing, so you have to really develop the skills of problem solving. And so if you uh, approach things from a memorizing point of view, you're going to maybe forget in a situation like an exam situation, and then you, you won't be able to fall back on your understanding of the material, and you might be writing answers that, uh, that really don't make sense and you should be aware that they don't make sense but you have no problem solving skill to to fall back on so I I, uh, I really encourage people to learn to think through problems instead of just memorizing I think as I'm marking my exams I see that a lot of students don't read the questions it seems like a simple thing you read the question and you answer the question but students often read the question and then they sort of convert it into the question that they wish it had been. And so they answer a question in their head instead of answering the question that I've set. So, especially with multiple choice, what I tell my students to do is read the question, don't look at the answers, and actually write out a short answer for that answers the question. And then you look at the answers and you see which of the multiple choice selections best matches your short answer. Because if students just look right at the answers, they're going to they're going to see something with a few of the right keywords in it and they're going to circle it. But you know, we're all kind of a little bit tricky and we like to insert the key keywords in a wrong answer. So maybe instead of saying increase, it'll say decrease. But students just, you know, it's sort of like a Pavlovian response. They see the word they're looking at and they circle the answer. So I guess that's my biggest suggestion for, I guess, just having to answer a multiple choice exam. The thing that always did me really well through my degree was the mnemonic. So in psych, a lot of the time, there's a many different theories or parts of a theory, and, and one of the most difficult things is integrating all of that. There's never one answer. You can never say, people do this purely because of that. There is usually maybe like, you know, six or seven different reasons why they might do it. So a lot of the time, your psych profs are presenting kind of information that is list-like to you, where there's, you know, there's this theory, there's that theory, and what saved me through my degree was making up like a funny mnemonic that I could remember the first letter of every part of the theory. So even today, I can actually, you know, and I, you know, I was at university and the mid-1990s and I can still remember some of the ones that I made. So you go into your exam and you quickly jot down these are the first letters of these, you know, the seven theories and you're good to go, you, you know, you remember instantly what you're supposed to be talking about. Another funny thing from research findings that, you know, intro psych students are always told is that you remember things better in the place that you learned them. So we found through research that this is the case. So you know, you have an, an exam in a specific room, I don't know, see if you can go in there, like when there's nobody else there, and learn it there, because you will remember it better at like, when you come to your test, because you've learned it in the same place. You have to go to like the big exam halls or whatever to do your exam, you're not, you're not directly looking at where your prof was standing in front of you. So, so picture that room that you were in, you know, picture that person talking. If you are in that horrible part of an exam where you you know, you're stressing out and something just goes clean out of your mind, then use visuals to, to get back to where you were, where, you know, when you learned it. And that should hopefully jolt your memory back to what it is you're trying to think of. Well, I would say that classroom learning is terribly important. So you should go to school, you should go to classes. However, it's only one part of the university experience. There is a lot of learning that takes place outside the classroom. 
For instance, in my own discipline, I think it's absolutely essential that politics students, that they are engaged in activities that can complement the academic courses. For instance, through um, writing about politics for the uh, university newspaper, uh, getting elected to the student governing body, or just participating in clubs and associations. I think it's clear that learning outside the classroom will enrich your university experience, but I'm also quite confident that it will prepare you better for life after graduation. Well, I think in terms of Bishop's University, one thing that I would really strongly recommend is the fact that it's such a small campus to take advantage of all the different clubs that you can actually partake in and participate in them. Uh, a lot of employers, when they're hiring, they look to see if students do actually more than just their degree. So the more clubs that you participate is actually the more experience that you can actually gather throughout your degree and it'll actually make you stand out from other candidates when they're applying for jobs. So that's the first thing I'd recommend. In comparison to a larger university, there's so much competition to get on these clubs and to do extra things while you're on campus. The beautiful fact with bishops is it is small, so you get a higher probability of actually getting on these committees and actually accumulating tons of actually valid experience that employers actually look for, which is amazing, right? And all of this stems from when you actually apply for a job, they're going to be comparing your CV to other people's CVs. So if you just have your degree, yeah, that's great, but chances are everyone else is going to have their degree as well. So if you have extra stuff on top of your degree, this actually works out really, really well. And it actually does compare and contrast you with other candidates and it actually makes you look a little bit. A lot of people actually don't think that through. So when they actually submit a CV, they submit the same CV to like, I don't know, 20 different companies and to 10 different universities. When in reality, what they should be doing is actually tailoring the resume for whatever position they're applying for. So in terms of your question, what should actually be incorporated in the CV? Well, it depends for what you're applying for. If you're applying for a job, key things employers would like to see is, what are you good at? What can you do actually do for my company? And that's stretched out across the board. Look, like I teach in business, that's not just for business, that can be for humanities, that can be for arts, that can be for sciences. So what you need to demonstrate is, do you actually have the skill set and the abilities to actually do that job? And there's different ways that you can actually do that. So you can emphasize on your skill set, you can emphasize on the experience that you actually had, uh, you can ex put a lot of emphasis even on like your volunteer experience that you did and the coursework that you've done. The key thing is that's how you choose to market yourself, but you gotta make sure it actually fits with the job. Well, it comes from two different perspectives. First of all, my own student life, which in fact was here at Bishops 50 years ago. Yeah, more than that even. And then later, as a professor both here and at Queen's Law School and Royal Military College, taught a lot of different places part-time. I'm a lawyer, but I love teaching part-time. I love every day I teach. And so I'm going to start with just talking about my own experience, because I was very social, and I'm pretty quick to learn, and I'm quick to forget. So I got to Bishops, and I started, you know, I, I wanted to make friends quickly, as we all do when we're young. I was shy, and I wanted to make friends, and I, was, I, I never said no to a party or going out, because I didn't want anybody not to like me. And I think that was a mistake. I mean, I think if I was doing it again, I would organize my time socially. I'd learn to say no to things and to, to pick my spots and to enjoy myself because the most important single thing I regret about my own student life is that I didn't have the discipline to treat every day as a learning day and, and to make sure that I didn't just go to classes but that I actually went to the library and got into it and did it every day. And if I'd done that, today I'd know a whole lot more Shakespeare. I've forgotten so much stuff that I would love to know today. And now I'm an old goat and I had this great opportunity and I got through school because I, I wasn't, I was quite good, not good, but I, I could get by, you know. But I just wish I'd been more disciplined because I was a kid, you know, and I just, I, I didn't really make a schedule and stick to it. And I wish I had. And as a, and a, and as a teacher, uh, I love the kids who, who talk to me who ask me questions, sometimes they're too shy. I was very shy to ask questions as a student. Terribly shy. Uh, but you realize if you're the guy at the front of the class, there's hardly ever a dumb question. I mean, I don't remember one. And you're so grateful for questions from your students. It shows that they're interested. It gives you a chance to explain things because if one person doesn't understand it, you know that there's going to be a lot of others who don't. So you get a chance to explain it better. And the student gets a chance to develop their thinking with you. And that's the most, that's the most thrilling thing for both student and professor. So, Speaking up, and if you're too shy, and go to the professor after class. I don't think I've ever known a professor who wasn't glad to see a student for a minute after class, ever. 
can have the time to talk and to uh, explain something. And we like it, and then you get to like it, and you get a much better education from it for it by using your professors, you know. Don't be shy and using them. So be patient socially when you start school. Pick your spots. Be smart about it. Be organized and, 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 and disciplined. Have a lot of fun, because you will have a lot of fun. You'll have great new friends. You'll have the greatest time, you know. But you'll have a better time if you're disciplined and organized. Pick your spots and talk up to your professor. That's my best advice. Thank <laughs> you.